So coral's been around since the Cambrian. More than 540 million years ago, coral evolved. There are some corals, some of the black corals, these deep water black corals you get that just seem to live forever. So you can have a single organism that's grown for four or 5,000 years. It's amazing. My name is John Sparks, and I'm a curator of ichthyology at the American Museum of Natural History. First of all, that diorama is, is very unusual in the sense that it's a two-level two diorama, which I think is kind of magical. So on the upper level in the Hall of Ocean Life, you'll see a view of Andros Island as if you were on a ship. You can see the ocean out to your left and you can see these big breakers breaking as they hit a coral reef. And then you get this wonderful lagoon and you look across that lagoon to Andros Island. But that kind of masks this extraordinary cacophony of life that was taking place underneath the water surface. My name is Melanie Stiasny and I'm curator of fishes here at the American Museum. When that diorama was built, the research was done for it in the 1920s and then it was installed in the 30s. At that time, we were incredibly a terrestrial species. I mean, pe people really didn't know anything about coral reefs. It was almost like images from the Mars rover. I mean, this was a place that no one knew about. They, 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 they just couldn't even imagine what it was like. It must have been an extraordinary endeavor to actually carry out the field work that was necessary to recreate this scene under the water in Andros Reef. It would have involved tremendous logistics. I mean, steamboat transportation, all of the scientific equipment. I mean, I think it was 40 tons of coral, which was actually brought from Andros to New York City to construct that coral reef. This was before scuba. So the only way they could really get down and draw it was to actually get down and draw it. And they had to have waterproof paints. And these guys, these artists, were going down there with their paintbrush and actually making these paintings underwater. That was phenomenal. I mean, that was like going to the moon or something. Corals and jellyfishes and sea anemones, they all fall in the same major group, Cnidaria. They all have a similar body plan in a way, these, these radially symmetrical, which means kind of circular tentacles coming out. It's an animal and they're multicellular and frequently they live in colonies and they can be either hard corals, which secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton. And you see these big brain corals, things like that, they all rely on the skeleton to grow and raise themselves up higher to you know, get more sunlight, get more food, basically. Or soft corals, as you'll see in many places. If you're diving on a reef, a lot of times, especially at night, you'll see the coral polyps extended out into the water and they're filter feeding. But if you think about the water off of New York or New Jersey, it's very cloudy. There's a lot more productivity here. It's a lot richer water. We don't have these, these tropical coral reefs here. When you go down to the Caribbean, the Bahamas, the water is very clear. There's not a lot of nutrients, not a lot of resources. So they rely on the, on the dinoflagellates then that live within their tissues to produce the food for them. So via sunlight, they're able to generate food. And if you think about it, you know, that, that allows them to live in these very unproductive waters. The coral benefits and the dinoflagellate benefits. So it's a symbiosis. Many corals, you'll have a male coral and a female coral. Um, others will be hermaphrodite. They're both male and female. But regardless, they produce eggs and sperm. Do you see these mass spawning of corals at certain times with certain triggers? And the triggers can be phases of the moon, temperature, often very subtle cues. But what happens is they all spawn at the same time. It makes perfect sense to be synchronized because you're just squirting eggs into the water and sperm into the water. And you want to make sure you do it at the same time so that the sperm and the eggs contact each other and fertilize the egg to produce a, a larvae. 
and it looks like a scum, it looks like a sludge, it looks like pollution, it's not pollution, it's fertilized coral eggs. And it floats on the water surface and then the fertilized eggs hatch into larvae and then these larvae are carried off in the ocean currents. And in time they will develop and settle out of the water column, land very often on another coral reef or maybe their own coral reef depending on how the, the water currents are. Every time I go to the Andros Roof, I, I see different things. I mean, depending on what, I'm, what I've been reading about, what I'm working on, what interests me at the time, you look, you stand, and you'll always see something different. 